Welcome to Powered by Ancestry. I'm your host, Kwesi Kanadu. In this episode, we'll focus on DNA and ancestry. Many of you are clearly aware that there are a number of professional companies that offer services that range from finding your genetic lines to give you insight into your ancestry. For people of African ancestry the world over, these companies have been very popular, especially in light of other TV shows that focus on tracing one roots and finding their ancestry. So in this age of big business about ancestry or finding one's ancestry, what is this relationship between genetics and ancestry? Is there a relationship that is reasonable between DNA or genetics and ancestry? These are the kinds of questions that we want to untangle today. DNA is, as many of you know, the basic building block in our cells. And DNA, of course, provides for everything or accounts for everything from complexion of our skin to the shape of our noses, to the color of our eyes, and much more. And so there's a lot to be gained from DNA. For instance, recently archeologists in Somerset, England, discovered a skeleton remains of a 10,000 year old man. And this man is very important because archeologists were able to extract from the skeletal remains genetic material, otherwise known as DNA. And that DNA sample was analyzed by researchers. And those researchers found that this man did not look like the people who now populate England and greater parts of Europe. In other words, he was not white. And that begs the question from DNA analysis, what and who was he? It comes to find out that this particular man had deep brown skin, but blue eyes. What this story of this 10,000 year old man revealed is this. 10,000 years ago in England and in certainly northern southern parts of Europe, people looked like him. In other words, pale complexion did not emerge in England until about 6,000 years ago. It also meant that places like Spain, Luxembourg also featured people that looked like him. Whereas in Northern Europe, which is much colder climate, the occurrence of pale complexion would occur a little bit earlier. Nonetheless, we find out something about what this man was in terms of his complexion, but we don't know who he was. And that's really the thorny issue about DNA. DNA gives us something about what we are, but can it tell us who we are? Hence, we're in the terrain of ancestry. Have any of you had your DNA sampled and given to one of these companies, and those companies given you a report about your ancestry? And here I'm speaking to particularly people of African ancestry who have used one or more of these companies. I have a friend, and she had ancestry tests done by three of these companies. In turn, she received almost three different reports or responses. And I smile because those responses really point to the very thorny and incomplete and partial picture that can come from DNA or genetics. You see, the body cell has 46 chromosomes. Sex cells, they have 23 chromosomes. The 23rd is either an X, female, or a Y, male. And so essentially, a girl is, in terms of chromosomes, is an X plus an X, whereas a boy or male is an X plus a Y. Think of the um, nucleus of a cell as a house. And in that house are these chromosomes, the 23 chromosomes. Plus, on these chromosomes are DNA, that genetic material, right? That's sort of the molecular picture that I want to paint for you. Against that picture is several factors we want to consider when we think about ancestry and DNA. And the question of, can ancestry tell us who we are and not simply what we are, biologically speaking? Here are some factors that complicate or make it difficult to answer the who we are question through DNA alone. First is the fact of migration. People move. 
And when people migrate, they also intermarry, they also mix with other peoples, whether they be of the same language or cultural group. That sort of mixing creates what are called mutations. These mutations occur at the level of DNA. And if we go back about a hundred generations, we can see that essentially the DNA in my body is the sum total of all the DNAs and all the mutations that came before me. And so because DNA mutates, whether that be mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited from the mothers and mothers only, or the Y chromosome, which comes from one parent, which is the male, and that's one that determines usually gender, biologically speaking, these both mutate at different rates. And it is that mutation that geneticists, people who study genetics, look for when they analyze our DNA. That's what those companies do when they take your DNA sample and put them under examination scrutiny in their laboratories. They look for the rate of mutation, the kind of mutations over time. What they provide us is based on another factor besides mutation, which is database. These databases are not created equally. Some are larger than others. Some claim to be larger than others. There are some that claim that have the largest samples for people of African ancestry in the world. Uh, others claim to have maybe 5-10% of the samples of people of African ancestry in the world. Either case, the databases are really the crucial hub for um, these companies selling their services. Now, this is what happens once you send your sample in. That sample is compared to what they have in the database. But let's say what you have in your genetic profile doesn't match or isn't available what they have in the database. Let's say, for instance, my report <laughs> or my analyses um, you know, points to the Zulu people in Southern Africa, but the database to which my report was, was, was compared and generated didn't have much samplings from the Zulu people. How do I know I descend from the Zulu? Or in other cases where there is matches for a people, let's say I have a match with the Mande people, but the database has a small sampling of Mande people, whereas they have larger samplings for Zulu or Yoruba or others, right? How do I know the match is accurate? How do I know the match or the supposed match has any worth of value? And really, how can the match be with Mende or Zulu when Zulu in their language means the people? When Mende or people who speak the language Malinke and the root word Mali from Malinke refers to hippopotamus. In other words, this game of tag I submit a sample and you tag me with a, with a person or a people or a place. How accurate and reliable is it? Now, I was born in the island of Jamaica, but it means that, that hundreds of thousands of other people of African ancestry were born in that island. And over time on that island, let's say 300 years, they have essentially mutated through procreation. And so that's one sorting out. But then, of course, I have a longer history, a longer ancestry, and that comes from West Africa. And so that's another, what, millennia of mutation that are happening. And then we add a third factor, in addition to mutation and the database pool that we have. We add migration. People move. So now we have mutating people that are moving all around, right, that scatter. And so when I get my sample back from Company A about my ancestry, that company may say, well, I come from a group called the Mende, who now live in Sierra Leone. How can I be certain that A, I belong to the Mende people when the Mende people are not stationary, not static, they move, they migrate, they intermarry, they procreate with people who are and who are not Mende. And am I really from Sierra Leone? When Sierra Leone is an invention of the British, Sierra Leone was a colony of the British in the 18th century, 19th century. Before the 18th century, there really was no Sierra Leone, and though the Portuguese, for example, had labeled a territory in the area uh, what became Sierra Leone, there isn't really any clear or stable boundary that makes Sierra Leone different from another country in present-day West Africa. And so 
it is these complications of mutations over time, of migration over time, of intermarriage and procreation that makes DNA a more complicated mix and not as simple as swabbing and providing a sample to company A, a company B, a company C. It's much more complex than that. And that is why in this mix of complexity, it's not certain if I am Mende or not. And if my people were only in Sierra Leone or not, or in Laban, Liberia, because these countries and nation states are recent political entities, are recent political examples with their defined boundaries. Three centuries ago, when my ancestors were shipped to Jamaica, these boundaries didn't exist. These countries didn't exist. And the cultural groups to which I may or may not have belonged had their own understanding of themselves, had their own particular sense about who they were and who they were not. Company A or B or C can't tell me that. This is why we have to combine what we get from these companies that sell a story of ancestry with other tools. This is why we have to also do deep digging in the archives where the records are. This is why we have to also do oral history with our family members, those who are living and those who remember. This is why we also have to use dreams. I'll come back to that in another episode. This is why we also have to use other tools that are available to us to try to map out, again, this package called Ancestry. Because the companies, however much they market themselves as providing you with a story of Ancestry, it's not a bullseye. It may give you something in the ballpark, but it's not a bullseye. And oftentimes what I see is that people often assume that the report they get is a bullseye. Yes, I come from this particular cultural group. Yes, I come from this particular place. Those particulars are more guesswork than they are exact or certain. Now, do DNA tests and the companies that provide them have a place in figuring out and, and, and unraveling and mapping out ancestry? Of course they do. But they are only one other tool in a broad toolkit. And so, what's the final word on DNA, genetics, and ancestry? Genetic analysis is very helpful. It gives us at least some patterns to work with. It gives us some genetic materials that we can then store and add to and compare with other materials that we've gathered from our research, from our deep digging. DNA doesn't tell us who we are. It can't. DNA doesn't have memory. DNA doesn't speak. DNA are simply these features of our biology that give us clues. DNA has much to offer and much to provide, but we have to put DNA and genetic analysis in context. And when it comes to ancestry, DNA or genetic analysis gives us really, again, an important tool to uh, investigate, to research, and to map out what we have onto other data that we have amassed through other kinds of inquiries and other kinds uh, of probing. Genetics is not who we are. Genetics can't tell us who we are because who we are is a package. At best, genetics can give us certain people in that package that plot along a line vaguely. They can't give us names. They can't give us histories of those people. Where do we get those other data? We'll tackle that and more in another video. I am Kwesi Kunadu. I've been your guide in this episode. I'll see you next time.